and someone kindly lent me their laser pointer so I could actually, you could actually see the dot. So I will talk about uh, a number of papers that, uh, I'm sorry? You can't hear. Okay, so the gentleman back there has to turn me on. The, the good. That sounds better. Yes or no? No. no? Can you move a little bit closer, maybe? I mean, it's oh, this is a little closer. Okay, let's try that. Okay, is that more audible? Okay, it's not exactly a Roman amphitheater here. Um, so I will talk about some work done with Paul Francois over the years, who is now at McGill in the physics and biology. Uh, so what I am concerned with is development, and particularly uh, developmental phenotypes. And that, of course, is by definition a matter of time and dynamics. Uh, this happens, of course, uh, through progressive refinement of patterns. And I should note rather forcefully for the non-biologists among you that although we have great volumes of data, uh, many genomes, uh, many chip seek, uh, RNA seek, uh, seek seek, whatever, uh, these things collectively tell us virtually nothing about developmental dynamics, i.e., if you were to hand to some person uh, these vast data collections uh, done for a sea urchin and a frog, he could not tell you, he could not predict from those vast collections whether at later times what would emerge from the embryo is in fact sea urchin or frog. There is no dynamics, no morphology in those vast data sets that one can discern. Obviously, if one's thinking about dynamics, uh, one has to think about dynamical systems, geometry, and bifurcations of flows, uh, as you know from applied mathematics. So my proposition will be, uh, which I will answer affirmatively in several very specific cases, uh, that the mere fact that, a, that I can evolve through positive selection uh, a pattern generating system of equations uh, will be, uh, I assert, a grounds for uh, saying that it is what we might see in the real world. So I'm going to uh, use this very simple notion of 19th century Darwinism by positive selection. Implications, of course, are that um, I'm assuming that you know, what we see is what's quick to evolve, so if you like survival of the fleetest. And of course, uh, the fact that I claim there is some mechanism here means that there is some degree of convergence in these dynamical patterning mechanisms at the level of phenotype. Of course, the genetic implementation can be much more contingent. So in comparison with things you have heard for the past couple of days, uh, this talk is rather mere engineering. In other words, a very specific solution to a very specific problem, uh, the virtue of which I uh, maintain is that it's very obvious if you're wrong, i.e. if your bridge falls down, it's clear you had troubles. So that uh, perhaps is good in an area where um, a hard, theoretic, you know, hard experimental and theoretical results and their confrontation are fairly rare. So to be more explicit, the setup involves um, uh, that I have to define what type of pattern I want to make. So I will look at embryos on the scale of, a, of phyla, and I will say certain patterns are prevalent in this class of embryos. I will then make up a fitness that favors that class of patterns. This has nothing to do with reproductive fitness. Uh, and I will then evolve a dynamical system which will make that pattern in response to the boundary conditions presented by the embryo. Uh, the representation for what I will show you is uh, dynamical systems built from what you might call pseudo-biochemical, biochemical mimetic-like parts. Uh, one imposes uh, simple dynamics, i.e. that the long time limit of my, of my dynamical models are either fixed points or cycles. Uh, one obviously evolves both the network and the parameters, and one just proceeds through neutral or fitness increasing changes. And uh, in this for this particular problem that I will show you, uh, although I will allude to others, uh, the setup is that you will, um, um, you will uh, mutate, evolve the network. You will then use it to, to time evolve uh, from the initial conditions to the end. And at the final time, you will evaluate the fitness of the resulting pattern. And then you will accept or reject. Uh, obviously, there is an issue here of how much my choice of fitness matters. Uh, do my mutation rates on the network and parameters matter? Uh, these latter issues are somewhat um, controlled by the assumption that we're just going to look at positive selection. So um, if the endpoint is uh, unique, certainly uh, precisely how I get there doesn't much matter. I will get there. Are there, are there any problems with uh, 
given the network or the, the, the morphology infinite time to form? No, no, it's all of order one. Everything is of order one. Simple problems. Uh, and that's for the same reason, issues of the previous couple of days uh, simply do not arise. Everything is small and uh, there's no issue of learning concept classes. Uh, one example will work just fine. Sorry, uh, but the, the, the evaluating fitness is at various steps along the way. Uh, in this particular case, it is of the time endpoint. Obviously, each network has its own fitness, right. but the fitness is evaluated as a result as in development. You run from embryo to adult, and then your fitness is assessed on the adult. So we're looking at the long time limit of the network, which, of course, is continually uh, challenged by evolution. Uh, an example of this setup is what uh, Nick, Martin, uh, Nick Barton called quantitative genetics, i.e. Uh, these people took on the challenge of evolving an eye. Um, quantitative genetics, as defined yesterday, means that we have, uh, our organisms have a bunch of traits. These traits are continuous. They're perhaps, there's perhaps 1% standing variation in the population. Um, it's partially inheritable, and anything can vary. And off you go. So these people show that if you define fitness as visual acuity, as calculated by physical optics, then if you start from a photosensitive patch and let it go and allow all properties of the material to vary, refractive index, shape, et cetera, you will evolve through a sequence of fitness <coughs> increasing changes at a camera eye with a very nice lens. And I recommend the paper to your attention. But it doesn't and it's fast. Okay. What? Yes? No, it's not. It's, it assumes that you're essentially, it is effectively, it's like assuming you're Gaussian. Of course. Of course. number of standard deviations away from the No, from no, the no, no, yeah. no. It's step by step. No, and of but course, it never talks about the generation of the variation. Yeah, of course. It's, it's what he called quantitative right. genetics. Precisely, right. And uh, that's probably a good idea for many things. It does not, right, precisely. Okay. So here is my model organism, shown here. Uh, it is <laughs> reasonable to uh, abstract from biology that. Um, Embryonic patterns are Cartesian. There is a anterior-posterior G network and a dorsal-ventral G network, and you take the direct product. Uh, as I've said before, you, you, development is by pattern refinement. It is also reasonable to assume uh, the best evidence was developed for fly in the 80s or 70s and 80s, that there are things called selector genes uh, which define uh, the cell types and body parts underneath them. So basically, the task of morphology is to correctly position the selector genes, and then what happens downstream is another package of the module. So this organism would be then described by some pattern of selector genes, uh, which are arrayed from head to tail in the appropriate color code, matching the pieces of the hypothetical uh, tetrapod. OK, a little bit more on the methods, which I will not otherwise dwell on. So we will evolve networks by mutation selection. Obviously, the network topology shall change, the parameters shall change, and in addition, we allow the subset of variables called outputs, those on which the fitness is assessed, to vary, i.e., uh, in accord with the idea of co-option, it's not a priori, you're not a priori told which uh, genes are to be the things on which will define the pattern. So that also evolves. Um, uh, we will take, we're, we're looking at just anterior posterior patterning. We will take a line of blobs. I call them cells, but they're sort of territories. Uh, the networks that I will show you can all function without direct cell cell communication. Uh, the other problems, we obviously add those effects. And uh, the thing <coughs> I term a morphogen will be a generic term for some protein that sets the initial symmetry breaking, which is then refined to the pattern. Eric, can I talk about yeah. the first one? So, yeah. I mean, in, am I right that in a loose sense, the first one is saying there's some function, but which variables that function is of? Yes. Um, you, you don't choose a priori. Right, right. So many possible. Right, right. Um, so, so obviously, of the you start variable. with one input and one output. The output shall be the fitness. Then, of course, you allow yourself, the output can flip around. You may, you may, you may create more selector genes. What you call a selector gene can, can move. I and mean, the notion of co option is that sometimes uh, genes can change function. So if something's around, we allow evolution to use it. It's not insane. Um, uh, so interact so the, the interactions have a uh, rather transcriptionally in inspired functional form like this, which uh, you probably have seen before, which was obviously mentioned in the first talk uh, on Monday morning. 
So relatively standard set of interactions. Okay, so now, how do I cook up a fitness for embryonic patterning? What I wish to do is I have to take any uh, set of selector genes as a function of position and assign a number to them. I wish the fitness to encourage diversity, i.e. I want many selector genes in the embryo, I want a complicated embryo. I want, however, a well-defined embryo, i.e. for a given position x, I want minimal diversity, right? I want to always put my heart here and not here. And in addition, uh, you want a smooth function which obviously rewards a little bit of pattern, i.e. you don't want to search in a golf course landscape. Okay, so how do we cook this up? Okay, so we say that we will define something that I will treat as a probability in quotation marks, which will just be the normalized uh, concentration of selector gene I at position X. So think of this as P of I given X. I will assume that all cells are equally interesting or equally important for the organism, and I will compose from these two things a, a two-variable like probability, which involves uh, the uh, selector identity I and the position X. Thus, my criterion are for maximum diversity, I will express in terms of entropy, naturally, which is to say that if I look at P of I, though it was just the number of the selector genes I in play, I want a lot of them, i.e. I want P log minus P log P to be large. So I want big diversity of selectors. However, I want minimum diversity given X, which I can express similarly as minimum entropy of the conditional probability, I given X. So S2 should be small, S1 should be large by my criterion. I have two terms, how do I combine them? It is very natural to assert that if I do a gene duplication, i.e. I take gene A in its position and I duplicate it to A prime, both expressed in identical position, I haven't made a better or worse embryo. I simply have put two marks on the same position. Therefore, my fitness should be invariant to gene duplication. And if you then carry through the calculation, you see that only one combination of these two parameters uh, will be invariant to gene duplication. And that is, uh, naturally enough, the mutual information between I and X. So, the, uh, the, what do you mean, what is, in this, in this context, gene duplication? How should I think about uh, Gene duplication will be that I simply have my uh, uh, variables as a function of concentration, one through 10, and I will make uh, variable 11, which will be a copy of 10 in okay. identical position. Okay. I will write all the formulas again, and I will observe that this combination okay, okay. is invariant. It's, it's the only one that is invariant. Right, which is not ridiculous. Okay. And of course, it has the very nice intuitive meaning that what I want to optimize is the mutual information between position and gene identity. So that's what you mean in quantitative by a complex organism, right? Everything, you know, Selector genes are tied to position, you know position, you know selecting, you know selecting, you know position. And the quality of that matching is mutual information, very natural. Um, and, okay, so um, at admission here, my ancestors uh, spent many years uh, minimizing something called F. And I will also minimize F, although I'll call it a fitness, so um, uh, I will slip. So the best fitness we could have is minus log N. Um, and it given n selectors. Yes? So is i meant to be the phenotype? Uh, i is meant to be the identity of a particular selector gene. And it will then give rise to type i body parts. n is the number of selected genes or the number uh, of n, 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 n is the number of selector genes, right? So if I have n genes, I can't do better than that by definition of mutual information. x would be much larger, but typically x is bigger than n. The number of selectors, right? It should be one to n, right? But L doesn't enter. L does. L simply is a line of cells, and typically I have more cells than than n, as you will see, <coughs> typically. But I don't have to. Okay. So to fix the definitions, uh, this configuration will be a fitness of minus 1.5, log 1.5. If I make the two territories equal. That is optimal for two selector genes, i.e., you know, in this configuration, I know as much as possible about position given the chemistry. So I divide it, obviously. If I add uh, another selector, so I have one, two, three selectors, which are the solid colors, this has a configuration of log of 2.3. And if I make the territories equal, I optimize the mutual information, and I get minus log 3. So this, this, is, this is the fitness, right? Is that clear? Very straightforward. 
But, but you can, wait, if you have three selectors. And, and I position them so as, to, so as to derive from the chemistry maximum information about where I am in position, mm -hmm. I have to make them equal and not overlapping. Mm -hmm. And this is in fact downhill. Uphill. But so the, lo the loss is invariant to shifting around where they cross the, bo the borderline. No, I have to or make each territory equal because it's mutual information between position and identity. Oh, okay. Mutual information. Therefore, it, you want equal sized territories. Mutual information. But wh why can't I tell, like, oh, because you can. I'm only, allowed, I'm only allowed to see relative concentration. Relative, relative, right. Yes, so wait, why, why make that assumption? Why uh, not? Be, be, because you could, the downstream thing could always adjust levels. Right, there's, there's level invariance in the, in the chemistry. So I thought that if you actually like looked at a Drosophila embryo, it could be sensitive to the absolute concentration. Yes, it is, but it, it's relative. When things overlap, they're less informed about where you are. This is, slight, this is somewhat idealized. I, I'm, I'm well over in biochemistry. This is slightly idealized, but not grossly. Relative is not about, and, and you know, epsilons don't hurt anything. These, these are very robust, sim simple-minded arguments, which is their virtue. There's content here. You'd be surprised. OK, now, so now we, now we run the machine. OK, so I will show you one example and then draw some conclusions. So, the deal is that I'm going to start with a morphogen, which is going to define head to tail. The morphogen will be on for a while, then it's be off. This is the fitness as a function of generation for my machine. This is one particular final network where the morphogen is shown as the inverted triangle, the genes in the network are these ovals, and the selector genes for which I compute the fitness are the other triangles. So I have a bunch of selectors. So you should, but you started with seven genes. No, 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 no. I start. I start with one input and one output, so I don't. So the things are defined. One input and one output, which is which are not connected. In fact, I start with the morphogen to define the geometry and the symmetry breaking, and I take one gene. So the first operation will be connect morphogen to gene. Okay. So I will show you a movie now of the dynamics defined by this network. It just goes. So I start with nothing. I start with the vacuum, quotation marks. And uh, if we are patient, which we're probably not, this morphogen, so this morphogen is shown down here, a little bit collapsed. It will disappear in a moment if we care to wait, which we probably don't. Uh, but this pattern will change slightly, not much. And this uh, uh, is a fitness of minus log 7. And if we're patient, the morphogen disappears. Things change a bit. And that's my final state. Manifestly, the final state is multi-stable, because this sits here in the absence of morphogen. So we have done this many times, of course, and let us then uh, uh, recapitulate properties of these networks. So they, they are set up by definition to be cell autonomous, no communication between the cells. The morphogen defines the cell position. Since the morphogen disappears and the pattern remains, there is multi-stability. And the point, the, the accomplishment of the gene network is that by virtue of this rather gradual morphogen, it has chosen a particular arrangement in the multi-stable landscape uh, and tied it in a unique way with position. Right? Every cell is identical at the beginning. They simply see different morphogen levels, which are uh, not, you know, not over a huge range. And at the end of the day, you have a multi-stable system where each cell has dropped into the appropriate uh, uh, territory. They're not, the territories here aren't all the same way. No, 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 it's not, you know, it's biology. They're not, that has, you know, it got where it got. No, but you, but you, you said the log 7 required them all being the same. No, 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 I said, I said, I mean, the, the, to hit the optimal bound, I mean, there's, there's 10, there, there's oh, okay. more than seven okay. things okay. here. Sorry. Right, could have been long. Yes? So, just the rest of the question, so, so you start from a string of cells but with no pattern of expression. Correct, like that. correct. Correct, correct, right, right. And initial condition, everything is zero, and initial uh, about, and, and, and for the evolution, uh, no network. Zero. Okay. So one more clarification. No more. Yes. So the, the mutual information you defined is invariant to permutations of the position. Yes. Right? So the uh, mutual, no, no, it's mutual information between position and, and, I, and color, color, color. Therefore, I always want to put eight in the same position. So if my network were very unstable and threw things around, 
then the relationship between the average density of whatever, mustard, and position would be very spread out. That would be bad news. Right? I am definitely favoring having a lock-in, uh, you know, in other words, the, the distribution of i given x should be tight. Low information, yes? But the x could be permuted. Uh, so uh, I mean, x, is x. Right. x is x. Right, x is 1 through 20. But wait, I mean, no, if, if I knew that I was at either end okay. of the organism, yep. Yeah. Wouldn't I have just as much mutual information if I knew that I was in the same right. in the same Right, but each position counts as e each cell is weighted equally, and it's the mutual information between X and gene identity. So there's no, it, it, there's no reason why X and X plus 1 have, having the same no, color no, no, is no, better no. There's, than there's X no, no, there's no, no, right, there's no cell communication. However, because of the smoothness of parameters, there tends to be correlation between adjacent cells because the, the genes are similar. Because the genes are, si are seeing because similar because levels of, of morphogens. Because of the continuity of the morphogens. Uh, yes, yes, precisely right. The morphogens continues, right, which is completely reasonable. Morphogens continues. And, and all of these are diffusing too, all of these. There, there is cell autonomous. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, you're right. They don't talk to each other. But the, the fact that they're seeing a smooth morphogen and we have smooth equations means that there's continuity between adjacent cells, except that there are then these jumps between various fates. Uh, we, we, I, I would maintain that you're thinking about Hox patterning, the Hox genes don't diffuse among themselves. The stuff upstream does, the, the morphogen stuff does, the, at, the, at the selector gene level they, they typically do not, you know, distal et cetera, do not diffuse. But also it's, it's the simplest. You want to see it is also the simplest. simplest, but it's not crazy. Right, the upstream stuff, I will show you examples, the upstream stuff manifestly diffuses at this level, it does not. Yes? Right. If I declare it, if, if evolution wishes to select it as a selector gene, which is also a random event, it will then put it in my selector gene list, compute the fitness function, give it a new color. And, and uh, do you have any, it just diffuses? The no, no. The cell autonomous. Cell autonomous. Which, this is not a surprise, right? This is... The topology of the network? Are you, I wish, it, 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 here it is. Okay. Uh, I know it's here, but <laughs> where did it come from? It, it, it evolved. I started yeah, with some nothing. Some algorithm for what you yeah. distribution of mutations and so on. Yeah, yeah, some arbitrary garbage where I put it, I make, I make, I add things to the network, I move things to the network, I change parameters, do this, I do that, the arbitrary numbers. And this you, is downhill. And you allow this to uh, activate and repress. Yes, the, the functions I showed you, right, and the, the colored arrows are what it evolves. Okay. The, the feature of all these networks is, more or less, is that the morphogen level sets the anterior boundary of the particular domains and repression from the posterior sets the posterior boundary. Not a surprise. You see this in natural systems. It's what you might have guessed if you were clever than we were. That's right, but the parameters you're changing are parameters of the dynamical system of which this is a fixed point. Yes, yeah. of which this solution is a fixed point solution. Right, so we change the network, we change all parameters of the network, we evolve from nothing, and we optimize the fitness, which is mutual information. Nothing, there's nothing up my sleeves. Do you have some sense of whether it'd be easy for this to get to, oh, to, well, no, because I was going to say Many other networks 10, are possible. You have a bunch of other ones, zoology. They all have the same phenotypic properties as discussed here. Okay, this gets, gets more interesting. Okay, now, a little bit of biology. Uh, you know, probably know, that uh, in uh, bilaterians, anterior posterior patterning is carried by these remarkably conserved Hox genes. They define the AP coordinates, they're sort of like a zip code, and the biochemistry of the regulation is immensely complex. The phenomenology is simple. Another picture of Hox, of Hox genes in the mouse vertebrae, and when you get uh, mutations in Hox genes, you will move around these various territories, and they are easy to track by means of the different shaped vertebrae from the humble mouse. Okay, so phenomenology. Uh, firstly, remarkably, and due to their uh, remarkable regulation, the um, uh, their order on the genome follows their expression anterior to posterior. Very unusual. In vertebrates, if I look at the order in which they are expressed, that will match the temporal order from anterior to posterior. The, the, the temporal order matches the positional order. 
the posterior prevalence rule is that the most posterior hox imposes its face on the anterior genes, i.e., in this very famous case from Ed Lewis, there is a small balancer organ here, which, when you make a hox mutation, converts the whole tear to a wing uh, with this sort of uh, logical um, diagram. That, of course, shows that development is modular, i.e., I have made a perfect wing where there was a whole tear. So, the da so what is downstream of the selector genes is very modular. At the selector gene level itself, it is not. And that is, of course, why, among other reasons, that these, uh, uh, these networks that uh, give rise to the body plan are common across phyla. They're very hard to change. So these are the phenomenology. Uh, uh, development is quite remarkable, and this is the frog, which goes from egg to tadpole, swimming in two days flat. If it doesn't, it becomes food for the fishes. To show you in more detail what actually happens to a frog embryo as it gastrulates, goes from the sphere to the cylinder, uh, you see that here. So what has happened is, uh, in all of 17 hours, is that you basically uh, the, you start out with a sphere. There's a northern hemisphere, so to speak, which is future ectoderm, a southern hemisphere, which is endoderm, an equatorial region, which is mesoderm. Uh, the process of gastrulation will take the equator, uh, converge it towards the Greenwich meridian, slide it down, pushing the endoderm in, elongating, building the anterior posterior axis. And you see the embryo at a stage where you have an open neural plate ahead here the future anus down there, and the neural plate will then close. The point of showing you this remarkable video is that I need to uh, motivate my choice of boundary condition for when I look at vertebrate hox patterning. So what happens is, so this is the experiment we just showed. Uh, these people have looked at hox expression in that, in a frog embryo, they see the sequence of, they see a temporal progression of Hox genes expressed on the equatorial band, which is converging and coming downward. At that temporal progression is then locked in to an anterior posterior pattern as those territories move to the Greenwich meridian, dive under, and then elongate along the notochord. <coughs> so the point of this, which may be well, went a little bit fast, is to motivate the boundary condition that I'm going to use on vertebrates, which is to say I'm going to idealize the three-dimensional morphology of gastrulation by simply saying I have my line of cells, which will be the future anterior-posterior axis, and I run a uh, morphogen across them and then demand at the end maximum mutual information. So I've changed the boundary condition from the static morphogen to this uh, wave that moves across the line of cells. Okay, because that is in keeping with, hap with, with, with what happens in vertebrates. So I do that, and the computer chugs away, and I now produce another network. So my morphogen is moving across the network here, chugs away. Various Hox genes are produced. And this is the terminal uh, network. And I see five territories in response to the sliding morphogen. So this can be done quite robustly. If I look at those patterns, I will discover temporal collinearity, i.e., if I look at the spatial order of gene expression, which I just showed you, and I then compare it with the temporal progression in a fixed cell in the posterior, the cell in the posterior, uh, that cell expresses a sequence of Hox genes which mirror, which follow the anterior to posterior progression. So we have uh, obtained one of these Hox phenomenology uh, properties, which is to say the temporal order matches the spatial order. Uh, the anterior homeotic mutation can also be similarly produced for sort of trivial reasons. That is to say, if I mutate gene 8, the, the territory of 5 moves back. And that is because, again, uh, there is mutual repression between the territories. I mutate the green one, and the purple one moves back. So that, again, is the, is the property displayed in these remarkable flies from Ed Lewis. So to uh, <coughs> recapitulate again, uh, I showed you firstly a static morphogen where the anterior boundaries were positioned from the morphogen. Uh, what is the analogous remark for the sliding gradient, which you just saw? Well, 
what evolution does is having solved one problem, it uh, uses it again. So what evolution does is when you give it a boundary condition, which is this sliding, uh, this, this, this sliding wave of morphogen, what it does is create a timer gene. So the timer gene simply says, I will go up in proportion to the amount of time I spend within that step. That is something which is proportional to the anterior-posterior distance. It then uses that timer gene more or less as it did the static morphogen to then position the selector genes. This is, of course, uh, a good way for, to control growth because, you, obviously, in something like a frog, uh, the uh, growth time will vary by a factor of two with temperature, as it does with fly. And uh, one could even speculate about the identity of that timer. So the, the gene three emerges. The only thing you're putting right, in is this right, morphogen. Right, timer. right, right. You put in the boundary and that emerges. And in you, some you, number of cases, not everyone. Time, the boundary is meaning this time dependent. Yes, morphogen. yes. And you put your finger on a subnetwork of this gene three? Uh, gene three is one gene, so it's this. Oh, it's, one of these. Okay. It, it, it's not a selector gene; it's an right. internal right. gene to the network. Uh, this also has the interesting feature, which I will show you. So, so again, so so we have arrived at the the Hox phenomenology by doing this evolution calculation in response to this boundary condition, which obviously I've derived by looking at the embryo. The other very interesting thing that this little calculation shows you is how. Uh, the transition from so-called long to short germ band insects may occur. So the relevant biology is shown here. So uh, what a insect person calls short is like the vertebrate mode, i.e. you first pattern the head and then you grow the trunk and abdomen and as you grow you pattern. So it's patterning with growth. That's short germ. Long germ is Drosophila. Like the static morphogen, you have the entire body laid out and then, parallel in time, you uh, pattern anterior and posterior. Now, if you look at the phylogeny, so flies down here and various other creatures up here, uh, um, et cetera, uh, you will see that there is a mixture of long and short germ patterning. Uh, if you're interested, uh, uh, a uh, 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 is, is a first-rate lab here of uh, Nippon Patel, who's you know, 10 minutes from here, who has uh, contributed a lot to this area. Anyway, you see an, an intermingling of long and short germ. Short germ, so-called sequential, is the uh, ancestral state. Long is derived. Now, the question is, how do you change the patterning system, which seems very complex? Uh, what I just showed you gives you a very natural way to move from short to long germ. Namely, you take the timer gene, which is there for the short germ sequential patterning, and you simply freeze it and call it the morphogen. That has the virtue of changing only one gene and allowing you to keep invariant all the downstream stuff. So there's great complexity. This, I mean, the zoology of, that, uh, of those networks was downstream. That could be left invariant. You simply have to change the timer and make it static. So a, a change at a high level makes it very easy to go from short to long without interrupting all the complex stuff downstream. Yes? So this is what you said now, the last sentence, is to explain this complexity that is yes. not what right. called, um, well, convex, when you say that. Well, but on, on the tree, the, the, to, to the, the convergence of, of these characters, complex yeah. characters. On the yes, it, 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 it is an experimental so fact that you, ha you have derived long from short many times. Yes, exactly. Fact. Okay. And you the question is only because of one gene. So this is what we suggest. Yeah. Right? There's no data. We suggest that it has happened many times. Fact, we suggest an explanation for that is that you can. In our, with this in these calculations, which are derived from this crazy simulation, uh, it predicts that there is something called a selector gene, which becomes the posterior morphogen when you go from long to sh when you go from short to long. Prediction. Or in other words, the non-parsimonious it is really non-parsimonious uh, yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. No. You're saying it's, e it's easy change. It's, it's an easy change. No, yeah, you, you, you don't have you don't have to recreate all the downstream stuff which is complex. That is fixed, as we know it's fixed. You know, the genes are fixed. We know that. Downstream stuff is fixed. The upstream stuff has changed. How does this happen without destroying the insect? Well, here, we, we, we suggest why. And it can be continuous. 
Uh, you pick a degrees of dynamic, right? But there's, but there's a family of dynamical systems of kinds of interactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you have here. Yes. Which you didn't show us. Correct. Where it went by so fast. Yeah, I, I didn't show you. I mean, it, it's it's in, it, the computer has found it. But you, no, but you have restrictions <coughs> on what kind of mutation. You have some underlying large family of possible dynamical systems. Yes. 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 Which, but that you don't have to pick cleverly. You pick it in a. Right. We we just moronic. It's moronic. We just take Michaelis Menten kinetics. Okay. And just anything goes. It is moronic. It is, however, interesting that you get something in response to generic boundary conditions, which is so, so to speak, lifelike. So the tyro gene is something which gradually is coming up. Eventually, it'll saturate. Yeah. But yeah. it saturates late enough that it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and levels are chosen such that at the right. end, it, you know, you have a, you know, and all this evolves via downhill optimization. Okay. So we have. We have evolved, but yes? The emergence of these timer genes, does it always happen? No, no. Some things get stuck and they die. Okay. It has happened more than once. Not every time, but you know. But is it, is it the only solution? The only, only, only one that we have found that will do it with those boundary conditions. Okay. Not a proof. We would love to have proofs. So we have evolved lots of other systems, which I show you here, some of which are published. So you just read the stuff. I will mention, just to give you the flavor, because I have a couple of minutes, a couple of other systems which are of interest and for which these types of algorithms work and which are rather informative. In other words, we could not have guessed these dynamical systems, at least I could not have guessed these dynamical <coughs> systems, nor could I have optimized parameters for them by just writing down something. So this is useful engineering, right? Engineering. Simple things for simple problems, but you know, they're predictions, right or wrong. Okay. So T cell activation. Uh, you know that T cells will respond to a few molecules of agonist. They will do so in a sea of self-molecules, and it's reasonable to assert that the difference between self and agonist is a factor of three to four in off-rate binding to the receptor. But can you translate in English words like agonist? <laughs> okay, so, 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 so agonist, agonist is, the thing, is the thing that is going to trigger the response. So agonist is a piece of some protein on the surface of an antigen presenting cell, which the T cell sees. So it's the foreign thing, enemy. Self is self. Which you, don't, which you don't want to react to. And the difference between the two is, a, my experiment, is a factor of three or four in the off rate. So very modest, i.e. a factor of one and a half kT in binding, so to speak. Nevertheless, you very reliably activate in response to the foreign thing in the, in the presence of a 10 to the fourth excess in concentration. Surprising. Kinetic proofreading will not do this if you look into the details. So what works was suggested by uh, Altam Bonnet and Germain in this paper. And what it involves is a, and this was then evolved by Francois in a postdoc, and we also played around with it in this paper here. The system is ligand binds to receptor. There is a phosphorylation cascade in kinetic proofreading with the important difference that partway down the cascade, you will create and activate a phosphatase, which then will then act on the cascade. This system, which does not look obvious, was evolved, solves the problem, and happens to be what these people suggested. It is not a trivial system, but does this, which is also not trivial. Uh, problem number two is optimal decision theory. <coughs> this is a branch of statistics that came to the fore, uh, presumably due to the exigencies of the Second World War. Uh, it, will, it will answer questions such as these. If I take a stream of data from distribution A or distribution B, and I wish to make a decision in as short a time as possible as to whether I'm seeing A or B, where they give it with a bound on the false positive rate, what is the algorithm and what is the fastest decision time? Another problem uh, would be a change point problem, i.e., I have a stream of data from distribution A. At some unknown time, the data will change to distribution B. I wish to predict that time when, I, when B starts with as short a delay as possible and with a bound on the false positive rate. Also a useful thing to do. So these problems were all solved by people in the statistics world long ago. This one, amusingly, uh, was uh, first solved by Sheryayev in 62, who was a student of Komogorov, so good pedigree. And he was working at some cybernetics institute whose uh, thankless task was to monitor the quality of Soviet factories, i.e. When, do you shut when does the junk coming out look so bad that you want to shut down the production line? 
<laughs> and for that, he did uh, good mathematics, which has far outlived the output of those Soviet factories. <laughs> In any event, um, this literature uh, only, so obviously sensory systems, either cognition, i.e., when does that movement in the grass uh, uh, say there's a tiger there or just the wind blowing, uh, or cells in an embryo, many cases in biology you could imagine want to do fast decisions. Nevertheless, this literature only entered the neural world, uh, the paper of Shaden around then, and in the cellular world uh, even later, and in this last thing which I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we can show that simple biochemical networks can get close to optimal and you could, up, you could choose the parameters via a simple search. So this problem can be easily solved. But you have, so you have the circuit already? Yes, you here, here, here we fooled around. Yeah, we did applied mathematics, I confess. This, was, uh, partially by, this is partially by design. Um, lastly, going back to the arthropods, uh, again, uh, work of Patel down, down the hill. Uh, arthropod evolution uh, can be schematized by this double funnel. Uh, the, what is common to all arthropods is the segmented pattern as displayed by the engrail gene shown here. That is the so-called so -called phylotypic stage. Uh, upstream of that, uh, you have genes that are more and more variable as you look across species. And there's a sort of funnel. So what Mike Levine did, so again, down the hill, uh, was to look at the uh, gap gene. So gap genes regulate the parallel gene. So Eve is a parallel gene, gap regulates parallel. So it's up here. If you compare fly and mosquito, the parallel gene Eve has its stripes. The gap genes which regulate it are the same, manifest with the same genes, tightly homologous, sequences are very close, et cetera. However, the position of these gap genes has moved, right? So giant. Uh, has moved and interchanged with hunchback. So the position of the gap genes have, have moved. So we asked ourselves, how is it that you can preserve the parallel genes and yet move around the gap genes? What is the path which preserves function and allows you to go from fly to mosquito? That is mathematically very analogous to finding the saddle point. So we have two ground states. We want to, we want to find the most fit path going between them. Uh, one could run the evolutionary algorithm in that way. And that makes interesting predictions about the ancestor morphology between fly and mosquito, which is checkable. Okay, this I will not discuss. Okay, fine. So, uh, characteristics of these evolved models. So, firstly, um, uh, we are evolving dynamical models. Dynamical models are to be thought of as a dynamical system, and you should think about the topology of the flow. Uh, the genes are things that you use to, at the end, fit to the phenomenological parameters. And this has been done in some detail in another problem where it is actually very useful, just as a technical thing. Evolution is, of course, a cascade of bifurcations. Uh, it is important that both the network <coughs> and the parameters evolve together. If, for example, you took our final network, scrambled the parameters, and asked, could you re-evolve the parameters for the complex network? The answer is no. You'll get stuck in various places. So it's very important, which was not a surprise, that you must evolve parameters and network together. When you look at these dynamical systems, uh, they are a mess, truly a mess, right? Insofar as what you like to do, you know, people of a certain generation like to do uh, as they did in the 19th century, which is say something is slow, some things are fast, can you eliminate, is something a function of something, all of that goes out the window. Everything is of order one. It's an utter mess. Nevertheless, it is simple in that it can all be found by local search, gradient search. Is so, it everything of order one when you first start getting something resembling the, yeah, the phenotype? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't start off with yeah, some yeah, machine yeah, no, and then no. Go. It really is always of order one. There's no, and of course, if you look at development, when the fly is, when the, 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 the uh, frog is gastrulating and doing its gyrations with, the, with, with things moving here, moving there, making the notochord, during those immense gyrations, uh, all the patterning is happening. As it, as it builds spatially, geometrically, the anterior posterior axis by the notochord, it is at the same time putting down the Hox pattern. So patterning and movement all happen together. There's nothing sequential about uh, development. It, all ha it wants to go fast, and everything overlaps everything. There's no, you don't wait. Were, were, you, were you asking whether the, the selection was kind of driving things to be yeah. all of whether one? Yeah, whether a new gene initially comes in, yeah. duplicate it, it bifurcates yeah. another gene. 
Are you already having jumps of order one? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, certainly when we evolve parameters, we say choose a parameter in this range. Yeah. So, every, so so we make jumps of order one, right? We're not making little jumps. This is sort of this is definitely macro evolution. We're looking at phyla, etc. It's macro evolution. So we're not going to spend time, right? So obviously we may be jumping over. You know, neutral or slightly deleterious. We don't really know. You know, as we say, we make a new thing, choose parameters of order one. So there, it's really macro revolution in that sense. But it's downhill. Okay. Um, in in many of these cases, we could not guess the model. So there are qualitative things, such as for these Hochschilds, I show you, but many others, where we could not guess the qualitative phenotype from the model, but it's checkable experimentally. So it's a useful uh, exploratory tool, just like a genetic screen, is a way of finding things you couldn't guess. Uh, the relevance to experiment is at, the is at a high level, so to speak, these properties I mentioned for Hox, i.e. how do you go from short to long germ insects, things like that's the high level qualitative uh, phenotype uh, that is predicted. <coughs> there are much lower level phenotypes, i.e. here's a functional form with five parameters, it has the requisite dynamics, there are 2,000 genes involved, how do you fit the 2,000 genes to the five parameters? That is a useful data reduction, and it's useful because you have a minimal set of parameters which gives you the correct dynamical behavior for the embryo and then you have to make your 5,000 genes fit. Uh, so last remark is... Okay, what 5,000 genes only have to fit a small number of parameters, you're saying? Yes, yes. There are a number of parameters in right, okay, many, so, many possible right, ways. Precise, right, precisely, right. And it, we, everyone speaks about the genotype to phenotype map. No one or very rarely says what the phenotype is in quantitative dynamical terms, right, which means a set of, set of order differential equations which have time, parameters, and as a function of time, give you, give you your shape. Right? So it behooves one, if you want to use the term, to actually display the phenotype in some useful form, i.e. as a dynamical process. So what I have given you is uh, simple 19th century Darwinism. I have asserted that if you take it literally, uh, you will derive for development interesting dynamical systems which as an engineering, it could be right or wrong, but at least interesting. And um, it's a very much a case-by-case -case study, but they're interesting cases, and obviously they motivate experiments. Thank you. So, we just have two or three questions. Yeah. Um, please, could you go back to the slide which shows the uh, gene regulatory network before the gene regulatory network? Okay, so well, one, of the, one of the, uh, okay, how about that one? So in all of them, I noticed that uh, there are lots of self loops. Uh, yes, right. And there are no loops which are going back to, going back. Uh, so no self loops, but no. Um, yes, there's there certain no other cycles. So I was just right. wondering two things. Firstly, why is that? And secondly, is that uh, consistent with the model? Okay. Um, so the the. Uh, revert the feedbacks are, of course, there because I demand that when the morphogen is gone, I have stable state. So I manifestly am selecting for multi-stability. I evaluate fitness at the at time equals infinity when the morphogen is gone. So I must have multi-stability. Well, and and the fact that they'll, they'll go back very far is uh, partially because uh, some some will somewhere. Um, it's yeah yeah it, it that's. It's probably because I'm demanding multi-stability, and the easiest way to do that is just a feedback on yourself. I mean, th 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 these things are composite I'm genes. Whether it's a constraint in your generative. No, 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 no. no. I just say, you know, here, here's a network. Pick, you know, you know we, we we definitely are saying here are the genes. Uh, draw an arrow anywhere on this graph. We are certainly are selecting where we put the arrows at random. Okay, well, that's an interesting feature then. So, what about the biology? Uh, the biology is not ridiculous for the Hox genes. These things are somewhat conflated. Be, you know, it's the stuff sort of the right. I mean, it, I mean, it's not ridiculous. I mean, the Hox genes, they have very special regulation. This, of course, we're just defining phenotype. It's not ridiculous that. I mean, is we got the Hox phenomenology, so we have the right regulatory properties for Hox, right? We have posterior prevalence and we have the time to space. So we have the right phenomenology. But they don't feed back directly on themselves, though. They are, the, the, the regulation is immensely complex. They don't directly do that, no. There's other ways, but there's other ways of becoming multi-stable. I mean, they use chromatin, all sorts of things. Gali, I think you had a question. Yeah, I, I wonder if, I'm assuming you introduced different 
different kinds of noise, either the yeah. diffusion or the being expressed. Yeah. The yes. Yes. And yes. I just wonder what type of effects it has on the neck. Uh, okay. These th again, it's very simple stuff. These things are all. Um, in the end of the day, you have a bunch of fixed points. So you could jiggle lots of stuff, you still have a bunch of fixed points. So in that sense, you have very strong stability. And obviously, you jiggle enough, you will move boundaries. But again, the, 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 so the, so to speak, intelligence of the network that positions the selector genes is that it rather robust, it's evolved to rather robustly read out the morphogen or this, uh, uh, you know, this wave of uh, morphogen read it out in a, in a robust way, a noise-independent way. Last question, I believe. What is the proportion of mutations that generate a system which is stable? What is the? Proportion of the mutations that generate a stable system. That's what As opposed to, well, I mean, the unstable ones we obviously don't, are thrown out, or I mean, are, are disfavored because, again, we evaluate fitness at time of infinity. So how many? What is the proportion in terms of? Uh, I don't know offhand. I mean, it's not absurd. I mean, you know, as we get a reasonable <coughs> acceptance rate. The other question is a hypothetical one. What would happen if you were to introduce yet another morphogen? Okay, it is of interest. Okay, so that is another level of. Um, we've thought about that. In other words, it, it, it is true in the embryo, as you probably know. That anterior, that AP and DV are separate systems. Now, assume you you ask why is that, and if you think about stability of dynamics, dynamical systems, it's much easier to make a stable patterning system in one if you make it if you force it to be one D. It's also <coughs> very good for stability if, as you make the dynamics, as in the embryo, you're basically pulling out the AP axis. That also suppresses instability. So. Making it one dimension is a, is, is a much more robust strategy to make a pattern than trying to let it flow on 2D at once and control everything. And the embryos do, you know, we, don't, we, we haven't selected, we have assumed it's 1D. But if you ask me you know, why, is it, why do you think it's 1D, I think there are mechanistic reasons for that too, which could come out, we have not done that, but I would imagine if you tried to, you know, tried to make a pattern, you would want to do it as Cartesian. I think we should probably continue in the coffee break, so we can get some coffee. If you could come back at 10.30 on the sound of the bell. <laughs>